You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Angie Schmidt, owner and principal at 3MPH Planning and Consulting. We chat about changing travel behavior in cities, the impact of recent social isolation on social trust, and polarization in policy solutions. Stay with us. Hey everybody, if you're in the Bay Area, we'll be hosting a happy hour Thursday, February 1st at 6 p.m. with the Urban Environmentalist Bay Area and Streets for People at Elixir, one of the oldest bars in San Francisco. Looking forward to seeing folks there and check out the show notes for more information. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Happy New Year and thanks infinitely to all the transit planners, bus drivers, advocates, and friends that support the show. To join this merry gang of zoning misfits and transit lovers, go to patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. $2 $2 a month will get you some stickers and a handwritten note. $10 a month will get you one of our transportation scarves. We appreciate everyone's support over the last year and look forward to sharing more episodes in 2024. That's patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Also, if you want to support the show in other ways, check out the show notes in your podcatcher or go to theoverheadwire.com to find links to our Cars or Cholesterol merch, our Talking Headways book club shop at bookshop.org, or sign up for a two-week free trial of our 18-year-old daily newsletter and archive. Thanks for supporting, and this year make sure to listen to this space for opportunities for happy hours, live performances, and updated information on coming attractions. Hope everyone starts 2024 out right, and now let's get back to the show. Angie Schmidt, welcome back to the Talking Headways podcast. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here back again, I guess. It's really exciting to have you back for, I think, the third time. We had you on when Tanya was still hosting with me, and then also back in 2020 when you finished your book in September 2020, which was, I guess, in the middle of the madness. And so I'm wondering how you're doing since then. Good. No, it's exciting to be back. I love the podcast. And we're like growing old together. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's been a long time, a long run. It's pretty awesome. So how has it been since 2020? I mean, like, basically, you wrote the book, you've started a consulting firm, you've done all kinds of really cool, interesting work. I'm wondering what's been going on in your world? Yeah, yeah, it's been sort of a wild ride, because my book came out right during the middle of the pandemic, like I finished it in February of 2020. And then it was like, okay, I'm gonna start a business, like, (laughs) cool. And then all of a sudden, it was like, whoa, like, the world is imploding. And then my kids were like not in school then for a really long time. So I wasn't even really able to like return to work quite the same way I would have otherwise. We're really almost like a year. I had a kindergartner who missed. I mean, a lot of people have heard me complain about it. He missed a full year of school. So that really impacted yeah. my ability to work for a little while. I also had a three-year-old at the time. But at the time, I did a lot of speaking about the book. I've sort of been on like an extended speaking tour about this book for quite a while. There was people that had me out to the West Coast to talk about it a year before it came out. So I was I traveled around a little bit talking about it like way before it came out. And when the book came out, I really worried, like, how relevant is this going to be? And that seems it's like a selfish concern, like in in light of everything that was going on and how serious that problem is. But I like even put this little forward on the book that was like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen now. It could be that pedestrian deaths will decline. That was sort of my guess based on we figured people are driving less. That's usually what happens. Traffic deaths decline. But uh, what actually happened was I got way, 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 way worse. So... There's been a lot of opportunities to talk about it as a result of that. So I've traveled around speaking about it quite a bit, which has been fun. Especially like last year, I went to Florida three times. (laughs) Florida have got a really serious problem. Yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of media interviews, but one thing that's really cool is I think a lot of people just saw the New York Times did a big expose about the problem. And the, the way issue is discussed has come so far in the last three or four years. When that New York Times expose came out, someone posted this thing I had written. I had been writing about it way back in 2017. So it it is encouraging to see like sort of the discussion moving in the right direction. I thought back at the time when I set out to write the book, if we can get sort of a news round about this problem, it will be really helpful to us in solving the problem. So here we are, the problem's gotten way worse, but there's been a big consciousness raising sort of about the subject, which is cool. I'm wondering how you feel about all of the news that's been coming out about it. I actually, I I talked to Beth Osborne like last week, and she was really excited about the media coverage of all the things that we talk about and all the things we care about getting much better. And I think that New York Times Magazine article that just came out 
is really kind of an indication of people are actually starting to look more seriously at the problem. And that deep dive was like, I, I learned stuff from that because I was I was like, oh yeah, the agitation, the peer pressure, those things I've, I've felt before when I'm driving, I just didn't even think about it. And so I think it's actually good that we're getting this new kind of group of reporters and folks focused on those types of issues. And I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I thought that was really great too, that New York Times Magazine article. And I I agree with the writer, almost everything he said, the way he framed it. I thought he hit a lot of that important points. I mean, a lot of us have sort of been arriving at the same place a Mm -hmm. little bit at the same time or a little bit different times. So I think like we've sort of converted, I think we've converted a lot of people, including like, uh, this is probably like a little bit right coded, but like the prestige media sort of has gotten the message, Mm. I think. And actually, I think a lot of important people within the industry have also gotten the message, including a lot of engineers, especially younger engineers. But I think farther behind and sort of reaching just kind of like the general public. And also, you know, I use like prestige media, you know, the sort of local television news stations, you know, the police departments that are doing like the day in and day out sort of communications about this topic, sort of less so. I would say. Yeah. Who is it that somebody did something recently about kind of figuring out, was it Kelsey Ralph or is it Tara? I can't remember exactly who it was, but somebody was doing something recently about how the police should be reporting traffic deaths or collisions and kind of a training system that that might be implemented for that. So I think that's interesting too. Well, so that's your book right away. And we actually talked with you on in September 2020 on episode 302. But I'm, I imagine that like, you know, since you've written that book, you've obviously been talking about it continuously since then. That's three, four years ago. And so that's pretty impressive that it has had the staying power. Yeah, I think it's like sort of a little bit fading now. Honestly, <laughs> You know, there's a lot of new new books that have come out that yeah. are pretty excited about and that are cool. But yeah, I don't think if I would have gone out on my own, I would have had the opportunity to sort of speak about it as much as I have. And um, that was actually one of my goals with writing the book was just to kind of do a lot of press because only so many people are going to read a nonfiction book like that. But, you know, if you can do NPR or whatever, you can really sort of expand sort of your scope. So that's been fun. It's been fun to travel around talking about it. Yeah. Well, I I wanted to shoot the breeze with you a bit about a piece of data that you came across and wrote about on your Substack, Unpopular Opinions. The National Household Travel Survey data from the 2022 survey came out and said that people are reporting they're taking over one trip less per day than they had back in 2017. Now, I want to make a little disclaimer before we go into the vibes and anecdotes, which I'd mostly like to do. But I want to note ahead of time that we know that the data collection methods have changed from 27 to 22 from the NHTS. They don't do the travel diary anymore. Uh, They collect the data online instead of doing in-person interviews. And actually, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which conducts the surveys, has noted that just going off memories instead of the diaries has actually led to 20% less trips reporting. So I saw this all noted in a blog that Joe Courtright wrote in City Observatory, showed up on Streets Blog USA. Other folks have noted this on social media. So I just want to get that out of the way ahead of time before we start talking about this from a like a feelings perspective, <laughs> because I have yeah. feelings about this. But <laughs> now that the disclaimer is out of the way, I, I still think and feel in my heart that we really are taking less trips. And I'm wondering what your initial reaction was to seeing that graphic. Because I know it's not apples to apples what they put out there, but it feels maybe approximately right. Yeah. So they said prior to the pandemic, like around 2017, 2019, people were taking an average or maybe it was median 3.5 trips a day. Yeah. And now that is down to only about two. So I, that's something I've written about a tiny bit and actually only a little bit, like over the course of my whole career at Streets Blog, thinking about trip making, who's making trips, what does it mean sort of to the quality of their life? So I, I think it hasn't been a big part of like sort of the urbanist discussion, but it is really important to people. This is like about people's mobility. And that's changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, so I, I wasn't trying to say, if you read the, the blog posts, I didn't necessarily say this is completely a horrible thing, but it does concern me a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, when we were talking about things like streetcars, for example, back in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, we were talking about and the Portland folks were talking about the trip not taken, right? The trip you could avoid if you lived in a walkable neighborhood or the the car trip you could avoid. And I feel like that was good from that perspective. But if you also think about it from the trips that people can't afford to take, but want to take, 
there is that you know distinction as well, where you have people living maybe in rural areas that don't get to take as many trips that they'd want to take. You have people who are you know maybe not making a trip because they can't afford it. That might be beneficial for like their mental health or for seeing friends or going grocery shopping and getting their medicine, whatever that might be. There are trips that people need to take that maybe they're not taking because they can't afford it. And so I think there's a distinction there between avoiding a trip, a car trip, versus like not having a trip that's possible because you can't afford it or because you you know don't have a means of transportation to get to where you're going. Yes, there's a total spectrum. And it's also who's taking the trips, right? So let's say you're a low income person who's disabled and you are limited sort of in your ability to take a healthcare related trip. That's obviously terrible. <laughs> but let's say you're a wealthy person who's already making a lot of trips every day and you skip a trip that's kind of frivolous sort of, and you're, you're really not made too much worse off by it. There, there's a big difference sort of there and they're all being counted as one trip. So um, I'm not so concerned about the, the rich person and the frivolous trip, but I am con sort of concerned about the lower income person who was making less trips in the first place, maybe who has some barriers, like you mentioned cost, ability that could, you know, really damage people's quality of life. The healthcare thing is really interesting to me too. We've had folks on the show talking about how, you know, healthcare providers are starting to think about providing transportation to people so they can get to their appointments because it actually costs them more money if they miss an appointment than it does if they can actually pay for their trip to get to a place. So I think that's an important part of it too, is thinking about some of those healthcare trips from a public health standpoint, which is really an interesting kind of side note to it as well. Yeah, that's a huge issue. And I'm on this little advisory committee in Cuyahoga County, where I live in Cleveland, and have been sitting around with a lot of service providers for older adults. And they're all talking about what a huge problem this is. And in a lot of cases, and I have someone like this in my family, people who are very isolated, people who are basically shut in, having trouble doing a healthcare trip that may be like one of their only trips they make during the week. So yeah, that's very concerning from like a social well-being standpoint, those kind of situations. How do you feel about your trips? Have you changed your trip making at all? Have you seen a difference between maybe even 2015, 2016 and now, um, not even just before the pandemic? So I'm sort of a bad, weird example because I always telecommuted. Like I, I spent nine years at Street Spog and the whole time I was telecommuting. And also I have children who are now six and eight. So when they were like young infants, that was really affecting my trip making a lot. There was some, you know, I was parked on the couch for months nursing <laughs> in <laughs> one point. But I do think like the pandemic, obviously that was so weird, you know, like we kind of like self-isolated for a long time, my husband and I, it wasn't just, we didn't just do three months, right? It was like pretty much almost till we were vaccinated, which was like a full year. We weren't doing things like restaurant trips and, you know, we weren't doing any after school activities with our kids. My kids were in school for a lot of the time. So that was very weird. And I, I think everyone sort of well, not everyone, you know, there was essential workers that were still reporting to the job every day. So people had different, very different experiences of the pandemic, but that was a big change for a lot of people. I think there were some aspects of it that for some people, especially more privileged people at first seemed kind of nice, like moving at a little slower pace. I don't think things have ever, we haven't gone back to normal, I, I would argue. I mean, I, I think there was some resistance to sort of the way NHTSA or whoever it was had framed their trip making data. And I understand the methodological sort of changes, but yeah, I, I sort of, you alluded to, and I sort of agree with you that I have a hard time understanding why anyone would be surprised yeah. that travel behaviors changed a lot. And it's not just a, one thing that people who were a little bit critical pointed out was, okay, well, there's just this NHTSA and the, you know, the way they are doing this travel reporting is a little bit outdated. They said, but I also cited some data from Streetlight data, which is actual cell phone records that was sort of in alignment with it. We've seen transit ridership fall off a cliff and never recover or never fully recover. So it's still only about 70% of what it was. Yeah, 70, 75, something like that. Yeah. yeah, that's a big change in travel behavior. I've seen other data sources that showed um, like our downtown, foot traffic has never recovered in our downtown. It's, you know, I think they're excited that it's up to about 85%. And I even saw another um, source of data that showed since the pandemic, there's so many examples. I mean, everything has shifted so much. 
school attendance is way down. There's like all over the country, there's a chronic absenteeism problem. So people are even, even things like that, that were sort of standby reliable. This is the place you go. People are going to less. So there, there's been big shifts, I think, in our society. And I absolutely think uh, with all these new technologies that have made it easier to meet, like we're doing right now, you know, on some level, it makes sense and may not be so terrible that people are having to make fewer trips, for example, for meetings, for business-related meetings. Yeah. I mean, I've worked from home since 2014 as as well. And so I have like a, a little bit of a pre kind of experience from not having to go to work every day in Oakland. But I also, you know, feel like even then I was taking some trips to go to like the first Thursday of every month, I went to a happy hour, Geo Beers happy hour. And I always did, you know, these certain things every week. And, and my wife and I went out to eat, you know, ever so much. And now, you know, we mostly, you know, go and take it out or I'll make a trip, but it's like not, you know, I'll go to the hospital if I need to or things like that. But those discretionary trips that we used to take are just not, we're just not taking as much. And now I have a 19 month old, you know, so there's that issue as well, where you're not going out as much anyways, because you have a, a little kid. But yeah. at the same time, like, I feel like some of those trips, even trips around the country, I haven't been taking like trips to conferences and things as much as I did. And then 2019, I felt like I probably went to five or six or so conferences. And then this year, I've been in the year before, I only went to like one. So there's lo- those trips too, that are like long, long, big trips that are missing as well, because I feel like there's a little bit of fear on our end, a little bit of, you know, worried about exposing yourself to potential harm at some point. I actually got COVID in, in October from just going on a trip to Zion. Uh, I think I got it in the airport. And so, you know, even that little tiny amount of exposure got me. So I think people are really worried about, you know, possibly getting COVID. And there's folks that are out there and they're just like not worried about it at all. And they're like, okay, if I get it, I get it. No big deal. But then there's also a subset of folks, I think, that are really reducing their travel because they're worried about it so much. See, okay, uh, I disagree a little bit. So sure. I think like you're in the Bay Area and maybe that's sort of a concentration of people who were on high alert and, you know, for political reasons, very cautious about COVID. But I think for the most part, I don't know, it's a, it's a good question. Why is there this hangover sort of in resistance to going out quite as, quite as much? Do people just enjoy sort of having a little bit more relaxed schedule? Do are people afraid, you know, of the virus? So, I mean, I've had the virus three times and I'm vaccinated. So after I had it and I was vaccinated, I just thought, you know, I, at that point for me, you know, I wasn't going too far out of my way to avoid it. Yeah. And that, you know, the whole state of Ohio, how many people are, you know, there's probably a few, but I think one thing that's having a big impact, and it's something that came up in that New York Times magazine article we referenced, is just sort of like there's been some sort of like damage done to sort of our social fabric, I guess I would say. I think people are a little bit out of practice with socializing, and maybe some people are even to the point where they're anxious about it. And maybe, you know, there are real concerns about contracting COVID, but also maybe there is some, you know, anxiety sort of in the mix there too. A lot of people are a little bit traumatized sort of by what we went through. I think it's kind of sort of comes through, like there's been some damage done to, like I mentioned the social fabric. So some of our institutions that were important, like social conveners, may not have survived the pandemic necessarily like where where I lived. And this was something I tried to bring up during the pandemic and people just kind of got angry at me about it. But like children's activities in particular were often sort of curtailed and there was much sort of stricter rules about children's activities than adult activities for whatever. Like in my city, casinos were open, nail salons are open, but schools are so closed. And like the last thing that I saw restricted was a children's area at the library sort of where we live, like way after, you know, up past a year, past vaccines, they still, the one thing that seemed to be restricted was children's stuff. And so I think it was difficult for some of those little groups to bounce back. Like I used to be member of this nonprofit group and it was volunteer run. All we did was little activities for families with kids. And we were completely inactive during the pandemic because it was just, you know, we couldn't really do events. People weren't, but then it was like our whole board quit. And then everyone was like, are we going to keep doing this? Is it not? And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try to take over and try to like keep this thing going. Just because I felt like kids have really made a lot of sacrifices. There really is a need for 
things for kids to do in Cleveland. I just thought it was important. So anyway, that was sort of long winded, but I think, you know, some little children's theaters or something that were hanging on by thread before that weren't able to weather. So that sort of thing, I think has had an impact too. That's interesting because I feel like there was this discussion before the pandemic about kids and parents even being oversubscribed even. And so do you think that that's part of it too, is like, they're like, oh, this is how life could be if we kind of, you know, just chilled out a little bit. I mean, your point about, you know, institutions dying over that time period because they couldn't make it is a very good one. And I think that's really important. But also there's this kind of like oversubscription to doing everything and going everywhere. And maybe people were like, okay, well, now we're going to think about it a little bit differently on the other side. Well, sure. But like, I think that's like a conversation that's happening among like very privileged parents, right? It's like your kid's doing lacrosse and hockey, you know, that's like a one percenter sort of problem, you know, like the New York Times subscriber base. It's like the assumption that that's who's reading it. But like, if you look at a place like Cleveland's, well, in Cleveland, you know, near majority of the kids who live in Cleveland live in poverty. Okay. It's a very poor city. Schools were closed for a year. We closed basketball courts. We closed, we took swings off their hooks for a full year in Cleveland. Like playgrounds were officially closed. I mean, people were still using them, but they just every, every, almost every positive activity for children was just taken away. And then it was like, oh, the murder rate tripled. And I, I'm not saying like those are the exact, you know, that's the exact cause, but, you know, it's taken years. One thing I've been on my soapbox complaining about, again, taking people off is, is like, we can't get our pools open and on a regular schedule. Even now it's been like almost five years. So I'm like, my kids are going to grow up and still not, you know, be able to trust that we can go to the pool during the summer and have it be open. So I think, yes, there were certainly kids that, you know, are oversubscribed and it's not a big deal, but those aren't the kids kids I'm concerned about. Sure, you sure. know, it's really the kids that were kind of like, okay, now you're going to play Nintendo Switch for a year. <laughs> and it's been hard for kids like that to get back in the classroom. And we see, you know, we see some fallout happening there. Yeah. One of the interesting things about your article that I kind of referenced too when I was thinking about this was your discussion about going to the bank, right? And thinking about how, you know, we're not really used to maybe waiting in lines and going out to do certain things because you can do it online now. And so I'm interested in that story as well. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I said, I was like sort of a tangent, but in my post, yeah, I had I had to go to the bank a few weeks ago. And actually, I probably maybe I could have avoided this trip to the bank, but I went to the bank. It was close to my house. And I, I remember just getting so impatient with the people in front of me in line and they're being totally pleasant. They're just having this pleasant chat with the cashier. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> quit like running around. Like, but I think it is like um, my husband does a lot of the shopping. So maybe that's part of it. But it is kind of rare that I go out now and physically stand in line behind other people the way we used to. And one of my sort of theories about that was one of the reasons like we've seen this big increase in um, dangerous driving. So I feel like in other aspects of our lives, certain things have become so seamless. It's like you order a t-shirt or something from some random site and it's shipped from China and you know it's on your porch in two days or something. It's just the click of a button, right? You don't have to even swipe your card anymore. You just tap it. But we haven't like, transportation has not come very far <laughs> since the 1990s. We're still just, maybe it's better in the Bay Area. It's very, you know, we, we were pretty hands off with it in Cleveland. And you're still just like sitting at these traffic lights, just like it's 1990. You know, that's <laughs> the sort of smart sort of movement really hasn't happened. So I, I think there is a little bit of a lag that's happened there that frustrates people because they're not, they're not used to dealing with that kind of thing quite as much in their day-to-day -day life. And I feel like after I read your item and then I read the New York Times Magazine item and they felt very connected. They felt like they were talking to each other because the discussion about peer pressure in the article kind of got that across to me too, where, you know, you're, you're lined up and then somebody's waiting behind you and waiting behind you and waiting behind you and you're trying to make a dangerous crossing. And so you have this pressure to like take that left. And I feel like I've taken that left many times in Texas where I was waiting on a farm to market road and the cars just kept coming and there was no overpass and there's no way to get through. There's no light. You just kind of have to wait. And then people are sitting behind you and you're like, crap, I got to go because all these people are sitting behind me. And it's like a lot of pressure to like move. And I feel like there's something to be said about that too, is like, not just like the trauma and the the stress that, that we are feeling in our lives, but also the pressure that comes from traveling in groups around other people. 
Yeah, and I, I quote another article on the Substack that I've been writing where I sort of complained about like the violent culture on the roadways and how it's gotten worse. We saw that before the pandemic, I would say, ramping up a little bit. Some of our like political, you know, crises <laughs> and the increased partisanship, you know, we saw that kind of come through with the Black Lives Matter protests and you had governors and Southern states kind of toying with the idea legally that it should be okay to run someone over if they're in the street. And we saw cars become, which is something I wrote about in my book, become very aggressive looking, sort of violent looking, and they're being sort of a little bit of a tie to certain cultural or political groups. So that's been sort of happening for a while. But yeah, I, I agree it's gotten really scary and bad out there. And one thing I, I think I've sort of learned since writing the book and going through the pandemic and thinking about all of this is I think like we tend to be like in this field very technocratic, right? So we want to talk about like curbs, you know, or, <laughs> you know, and not like children's groups, are they functioning, you know? But I do think there's like an element of, sort of social trust that's really important in all this that's been really damaged. And I think like sort of the way the pandemic was sort of conceptualized in our country, it was very like corrosive. It was very like us versus them. Like these other people have caused the problem because they're selfish or something, you know, like they are murderers because they want to go to... <laughs> I don't know, the things people were saying were so crazy, but I do think that, that that was very sort of corrosive to just the fabric of our society. And like I said, to social trust. And another thing that we should probably mention is that enforcement is down a lot, which I think is a factor yeah. also. And obviously there's legitimate reasons why police are doing less enforcement. Obviously a lot of the problems with the way it's being done were brought to the forefront in the last few years, but I do think, and there's some people in the industry that would say enforcement has no impact, but I don't agree with that. I've seen studies where they, they show that it does have, you know, and, and I don't know if those people would argue like we shouldn't have highway patrol out on interstate highways, like outside of Texas, that would be too extreme sort of for me. So, yeah. but without sort of social trust, all of this is dead on arrival. We can't we can't patrol our highways if there's no social trust, if there's no trust that police are going to do their job fairly. And then if there's no social trust, we can't redesign streets either. People don't trust that the government has their best interests at heart. We can't talk to each other and debate it in a rational way to kind of make progress on some of our problems. Is it hard to come to a consensus on certain things because of just the way that we're talking with each other? I mean, not us personally, but I'm just meaning general in the general public. I mean, I'm thinking about like the way we talk about like traffic cameras or the way we talk, we're talking about right now about congestion pricing, those types of things where they're enforcement, they're technocratic, they're very, you know, focused on the problem, but they're also very polarizing when people start to talk about these things. Um, today, I think the governor of New Jersey sued the state of New York and the MTA for, you know, violating the Commerce Clause, uh, he says, so in the Constitution. Yeah. So we're, we're getting like really kind of combative about these potential solutions to some of the issues. And it, it seems to be getting worse and worse. Yeah, I think there is like, and I sort of blame social media, like there's this rhetorical escalation, like Twitter, you know, is <laughs> There's not any reward for like moderating your views, right? Like you're sort of preaching to the choir. That's who your audience is, you know, and you're going to have a like big fight. That's what's going to improve engagement or something, you know, sort of bringing out the worst in us. So I, I, I do think that's sort of a problem. And like, obviously I've been engaged in these kind of battles for years, but I do think I try to write something again on my sub stack. That's just like, why can't we just acknowledge like that driving in the city sucks, city driving sucks and people are really frustrated and, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be sort of um, zero sum. I know that it is like in a lot of places like Manhattan, but there's no reason we can't like sort of improve safety for pedestrians on certain roads in Cleveland, but also be trying to like sort of minimize some of the needless hassles 
the driver's face and sort of just acknowledge, like, we understand that you have to get to work. You're not like a bad person because of the circumstances of where your house is and where your, your workplace is. We sort of get that. And you're an important user here too. We're not against you because those are your circumstances. Yeah. You know, I, I don't talk about this too much in the show or otherwise, but I feel like you're correct on the engagement in social media thing. I have a lot of followers on social media, built them up over a period of time, and I've seen the engagement dropping like a rock. It was even pre-pandemic and pre-Elon. I mean, basically me who posts articles every day, like three articles a day, and I post a couple of things here and a couple of things there. I'm not combative. I, I try not to be anyways, but the times I am combative, I get you know uh, engagement, which is unfortunate and, and then unsettling. But for the most part, I just kind of post stuff, and that's not threatening. It's not you know, it's interest yeah. of public interest. It's just like yeah. kind of stuff. But I've seen like my views. And nowadays, I think it's because a lot of people have left the platform. But even before it went, you know, from a post that was just a news item getting like 5000 looks to now getting like 200, right? right? It's like a crazy drop. But then you see all these folks that are just like engaged and engaging, engaging and, and fight and fight and fight. And they're the ones whose like numbers are going up, 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 right? And so I feel like the social media definitely like trains us to, if we're trying to get attention, if we're trying to get our points across, it kind of trains us to be that angry or combative or just like that way yes. about how to engage people online when I feel like the whole point of me and my ideas is just education yeah. and interest. You're trying to do right? something more pro-social. <laughs> I'm interested in stuff, right? I think it's cool, you know, yeah. but that's frustrating in, in that way. And that's the way that the discussion happens online when it comes to anything, whether that's bus network redesigns or or talking about traffic cameras or in California specifically, the NIMBY YIMBY arguments, right. housing Twitter is like a mess. Right. So it's interesting how that might bleed over into all of these other aspects of life, whether it's driving or trying to figure out how you're going to take the bus and whether you're going to sit next to a certain person or whatever it is. Right. There's like a whole thing that comes from this training that has been embedded for the right. last, what, 10 years or so? Right. Yeah. It's very weird. And I also think there's like a little bit of delusion that comes into it too, because if people are sort of telling people what they want to hear. You know, like I also go back and forth with folks who'll say, we don't need electric cars. And I'm just like, what, how are people in suburban Atlanta, how are they supposed to get to work? Like, it's not safe for them to just hop on. A, I mean, it's just like a little bit, I don't know. I mean, and they'll be like angry at me for saying that. Uh, so anything that's like, I don't know, a little bit more moderate becomes like something to yeah. rage against. Even though I think we could end up being a little bit, like I said, a little bit deluded if we spend too much time online and not enough time sort of interacting with people in person. It feels like, though, that because of social media, to a certain extent, there's no other like forum to have these discussions. And I think that's unfortunate, too. Yeah. There's no other place, really, where you can... And, you know, obviously there's a benefit to it that you can reach a lot of people, but there's a negative to it that you can reach a lot of people right. as well. In our previous lives, when, <sighs> you know, when you're at Streets Blog and I was blogging at the Overhead Wire, there was this RSS feeds and you could read and you can find articles right. and items that you liked and you got information that you're interested in and you can interact with the people in the forums there that were maybe, you know, you disagreed with them, but you didn't have like get it shoved in your face all the time. Right. And so I feel like that there was an evolution to this kind of uh, saccharine discussion where you just got all this really great information, but then you also got all of like the, the bad stuff that came with it. It's like eating all of your candy at Halloween and then feeling it the next day. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sort of like nostalgic for like web 1.02, which is like really dates me. I heard someone once say that like Twitter was like the methamphetamine of like social media. <laughs> But, you know, and I was like, for a long time, it's like, if you want to be a writer, it's like, or you want to do writing, it's like, you kind of have to be on Twitter too, even though I was like, hey, this is yeah. ruining my mental health, you know? Yeah, Awful. yeah. Awful. And then I was like, well, you know, it's still not worth it. But lately, like this little thing, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out Substack. I think Substack sort of has some potential. A lot of writers have gone over there. There's certain things I like about it. We'll sort of see, but I, I do think people are a lot more reasonable. This is, again, it's more long form writing. So there, there's, you know, more opportunity to sort of hedge what you're saying and sort of forge, you know, more balance um, instead of just sort of going to war with the other side. Yeah, you can write a detailed post with all of the explanations rather than just a 
240 to whatever the character yeah. whatever character tweet is right yeah even a thread gets lost when there's the one tweet at the top sometimes yeah how are you feeling about this year and transportation policy like what have you been thinking about lately in terms of the transportation sphere i'm curious like kind of your feelings about going into 2024 Well, in some ways, I'm pretty bummed. (laughs) Like I, you know, in 2019, I would not have been like, I hope we're down 30% in transit ridership. I mean, that's a blow. That's a huge blow. And some of those trips might be trips avoided that are people just telecommuting. That's the only silver lining I can sort of see in it. Yeah. So that's going to be a difficult problem to fix. I also, you know, I cited information in my article showing that walking is down dramatically. They said, this is streetlight data, maybe take it with a grain of salt because I know it's not perfect either. But they were saying down 36% since the pandemic, which is astronomical. And we were already hardly doing any walking. So that's disappointing. I'm curious, like, I know nobody has an answer to this, but like, how did we lose so much walking? Like, is it all those work trips in New York City? Or is it like, is it just people, you know, working from home, not walking to the bus every day? I mean, the trip level that they put was like 250 feet or something like 250 meters or something like that. It was like a it was like a quarter of a quarter of a mile, almost like a really small amount that they were measuring like oh. to, to above. And so I'm wondering where that loss and drop came from. Is it everybody taking bikes in cities? Like, I'm just so curious because it feels like, I don't know, I, I might not take as many trips, but I feel like I still walk the same amount or a similar amount as I did before, but maybe not. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, maybe people are just less active. Like there's some evidence that children are less active. I've been looking at sort of since the pandemic. It's like, okay, all your sports are canceled for a year or something. Well, you know, it's not it's so easy to just flip a switch and go back to normal. Like There's habits and patterns yeah. that develop, yeah. I guess. I don't know. I, and I'm not going to sit here and go to the mat for this. Uh, <laughs> no, no, like no. For the street like data. It could be something weird with the data. Well, that data might be disappearing soon, too, because at Impact, Karen Chappell was talking about, you know, they did that big study at the University of Toronto about downtown recoveries, and they used cell phone data. And she said that the cell phone data actually might be disappearing soon because Apple might yes. not be letting people use it as much, or they might allow people to turn it off on their phones, or it might already ship yes. off. So that might be actually a loss of something that we have been interested in over the last few years that might disappear soon too. So I find that interesting too, just from a data standpoint. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard some people make this kind of arguments and there's a bunch of different companies that do this now. One thing I will say about like transportation and planning in general is just, I was at a um, conference this year and it has all become so technical. Having that kind of data and the, the ability to sort of map it really easily. And a lot of things that used to be really labor intensive are being sort of automated in the field. So that's kind of interesting. I think the field's going to become, you know, much soft. Well, on one hand, a little bit softer, you know, you still need someone to do like community outreach and then maybe more technical Yeah. on the other end too. So I'm depressed about many things. <laughs> I'm depressed about like central cities. I don't think the data there is very good either. Yeah. But one thing that was kind of exciting and encouraging this year, I was thinking about writing something about this because I write so much stuff that's depressing and sad. But um, I got to read the Bright Line in Florida this year. It's pretty cool. I was down, I spoke in Orlando, and then my sister lives in Fort Lauderdale. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go visit her. I'll take the Bright Line. And that was like kind of surreal. I mean, it's beautiful. Uh, it was just kind of surreal to be able to hop on a train like that in Florida and get where I needed to go. With the kids, they were, it was a great, they were really accommodating the children. It was honestly like fancier and nicer than the trains I took. I've, a lot of the trains I've taken in Europe. I was just in Ireland last year. It was definitely a lot nicer than that, but I, Ireland isn't known for having a nice rail system, but, but regardless. <laughs> yeah. I was in Miami for Impact uh, back in 2022, and yeah, it, we rode the line, and it was really, really impressive. And just from a like, I feel like this is something that we might overlook sometimes, but it felt very clean. It felt the aesthetics of it were very nice. It didn't go super fast, like it's not a high speed train or anything like that, but it just felt comfortable. And I think that that can go a long way to getting people to like be interested in taking a train. Yeah, I would go farther and say it's almost kind of like luxurious. 
which is no. what my sister said too. It's like, it's kind of, and the tickets are like not, I mean, and the people in Florida complain about them. I don't know. Hopefully it'll be large <laughs> adoption. it was nice. And now we have, I wrote something for Bloomberg a few months ago and they actually, I wanted to put a stronger headline on it and they did. And it's like, we should be excited about this new era we're entering in passenger rail because Biden, the Democrats, God love them, <laughs> did get through the spending in the infrastructure bill, like a big increase in spending for inner city passenger rail. And it's starting to get out there and it could have a big impact. It could yeah. be biggest in our lifetime increase. That's something that people like me have been dreaming about for more than a decade. And there's starting to be some progress. I mean, yeah. riding Brightline was cool. You could see how maybe in a few years, Texas, maybe Los Angeles to Vegas, you know, someday Los Angeles to San Francisco, <laughs> Acela, right, right. You know, there's no guarantees about that. But Crossing like, my finger. They're pouring big money into the Northeast corridor. So some of our most populated regions, you know, there's movement on getting them connected by rail. And uh, the Amtrak's wider plan would connect a lot of our less huge cities also as well and improve service for people that live you know, in smaller areas that have been underserved. So that's exciting and cool. Yeah, there's that happening. And then I feel like just generally the discussions that we're having are more advanced. And I appreciate that because we're having this whole discussion about the MUTCD. I don't think that would have ever gotten any press before, right? That would have never gotten into any newspapers or anything before this year. And we're talking about all of these other, I mean, this New York Times Magazine article just the discussion writ large about you know safety and streets and transportation and policy and those types of things are getting better. Even if transit is down, I feel like at least we're having this discussion about, oh, why is it down? Like, what can we do to fix it? Maybe um, the work commute wasn't the best thing to build a, a system around and, and like those types of things. So the reporting's getting better. Reporters that are writing about these things are actually impacted by it. And so they're writing more thoughtfully about it. And I just, I don't know, I just appreciate that. And, and I feel like positive about that going into this year. Yeah, I'll also say that like the safe street, I'm really excited about safe streets and roads for all too. The grant, there's a new grant pro relatively new grant program from USDOT. Again, it's like these a uh, couple of heroes somewhere in the mix in DC got this funding through. And you know, finally there's decent federal money to implement some of these vision zero policies that cities have been trying to like kind of piece together with duct tape. So I think there's a lot of potential there. Like, you know, we've been running around like the crazy people being like, we don't have to have, you know, traffic deaths. Look at Oslo, you know? And everyone's yeah. like, okay, but if we could sort of show, and I think we're starting to get there with some of these cities in New Jersey, like um, Hoboken. And, but even there's yeah. like some examples outside of there too now, like Madison, Wisconsin, I heard has had a significant decrease. And then that's even prior to this money coming out. So I'm hope I'm really hopeful that we'll see a good outcome. We'll see like seriously improved safety outcomes as a result of those grants. And then hopefully after that, it will be hard or politically inconvenient to remove all that funding. Although I do think that, that there's a strong likelihood that could happen if the presidency changes hands, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad there's some stuff on the horizon that's really good. So you started a consulting firm, you're doing talks. Where can folks find you if they wish to reach out to you? Yeah. So my firm is 3MPH Planning and Consulting. We have a website, 3MPHplanning.com. My email is just Angie at 3MPHplanning.com. I have the sub stack. People reach out to me all the time. <laughs> I, get a lot of it. I get a lot of those kind of inquiries. So yeah, I should be pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Angie, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time and it's good to catch up. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of the Orbit Wire and published first at Streets Blog USA. Thanks to our generous Patreon supporters for supporting this week's podcast. And you can find out more at patreon.com slash the Orbit Wire. And sign up for our 17-year-old newsletter by visiting theorbitheadwire.com. To get the show each week, follow along at your podcatcher of choice, including Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, YouTube, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. And if you can't find it there, you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.org. We'll see you next time at Talking Headways.